Yeah, this is Billiam. Part of the anime experience, particularly as a Westerner in the early 2000s, is all of the anime influence products Western countries made. Excellent example, Avatar The Last Airbender. Better example, Totally Spies. But the best, supreme example, how to draw manga. Hey, who was around to teach that guy how to draw manga? It was uncharted territory. But how to draw manga was the first thing I thought of when I started looking back on Code Lyoko. The character designs are either really cool and a perfect encapsulation for the wide variety of anime inspired shows produced in the West at the time, or the worst thing I've ever seen. I haven't made up my mind. That theme song goes hard though. Code Lyoko originally aired on France 3 in France, its country of origin, but here in the US it aired on Cartoon Network during an action programming block Maguzi. Code Lyoko, like much anime and anime inspired content, is about a bunch of unique kids at a boarding school. Not a ninja boarding school or a superhero boarding school or a school at the host club or a fairy school, but a school with an outrageous tuition. I mean, look at this place. In France, nonetheless. Nearby their school, bunch of rich kids discover a supercomputer inside of a factory that lets them travel to a virtual world, Lyoko, where they meet a virtual girl, Ailita, who tries to stop an evil computer virus, Xana, who uses the supercomputer to affect the real world. So they have to go into Lyoko to find out where Xana is basing its operations and destroy its tower it creates by having Ailita enter the code, Lyoko, saving the world from harm. And if the world was harmed in any way, they could always use the supercomputer to roll back time. That's right, just like Lost, Code Lyoko was always about time travel. The four, five, 10 head art style is complemented by the virtual world style, which is animated in 3D. For the time, it has this perfect bulgy look, reminiscent of video game cutscenes. And when the scenes transition styles, there's a special flair to it. Like when you reach a cutscene in a video game. Basically, there's a new level for them to be in each episode in Lyoko's four themed sectors. It has a charm to it for sure. Yeah, all right. So this video is in collaboration with Jordan Fringe. Hey, this is Jordan Fringe. I make YouTube videos about cartoons and TV shows. Plus, we made a second part to this Code Lyoko video on my channel. What Jordan will tell you is we collabed viciously on this project. We both transferred ourselves into Lyoko and got into the pits of the virtual mud together, into the thick of Lyoko. There's so much to talk about that we basically each made our own 30 minute video and neither one of them really covers the same thing. It's like an A side and a B side to a record. You need both to get the whole picture. The dark side of the forehead. That's the album we produced together. So make sure to listen to it all, this, then, that. So let's take a look back on Code Lyoko, cause I really don't have a choice. You can't miss those foreheads. <laughs> wow, what a video it's been thus far. But what's more amazing than that is the product from today's sponsor, Raycon. These little buds are half the price of other premium audio brands. Whoa, this is the shake test, watch as my head moves a lot, but the headphones stay still. That's on account of their optimized gel tips. You can fit them to your ear. Raycon headphones are awesome and customers agree with over 50,000 five-star reviews. I love using my Raycons to listen to incredible royalty-free pop music while I'm doing the dishes, cleaning the office, taking a walk, or maybe even doing taxes. They're great in sweat resistance with 32 hours of battery life and eight hours of playback. So you can listen with no interruption, perfect hands-free grooving for an eight hour hands-free grooving session. If you need to focus, Raycon Everyday Earbuds are automatically set to noise isolation mode to block out outside noise. You can also switch it to awareness mode by holding down the right earbud for three seconds and boom, you can continue hands-free grooving while paying attention to everything around you. Total mobility. So if you you want to get groovy you can support the channel by clicking the link in the description or going to buyraycon.com slash billium to get 15% off of your first order. Thank you again to Raycon for sponsoring this video. So like every squad the characters in Lyoko have a name for themselves the Lyoko Warriors. Remember when the Dragon Ball Z dub tried to call Goku's friends the Z fighters? More like the L fighters am I right? They get their 
his ass kicked. So first we have Auric, a serious boy with serious protagonist energy. In Lyoko, he wields the blade, seriously. He's like a boy who doesn't know how to speak his feelings and that comes out with his relationship with Yumi. Yumi is the stay at home girl who has to come up with all sorts of excuses to stay at school to go into Lyoko. Her parents are wondering where she is all this time. She and Auric do martial arts together. They beat each other up and wrestle a whole bunch when they should be talking to each other. There's always something getting in the way of them having a conversation. She has a kimono inspired outfit with fans in Lyoko. Then you have Odd, he's the funny boy. The girls in the class avoid him. His dog is ugly as it has a visible ball sack. This dog and Crazy Frog do indeed have the visible display of their junk in common. His Lyoko outfit, he's a little cat boy, but that graphic of his dog pissing, why? He'd buy this fart night sticker that I found at a Christian ice cream store for sure. Then you have Jeremy, the nerdy guy in the chair. His English dub voice is awful. Uh oh, bad news. When I is working on that interface, I can't do anything from my end. Many of the English dub choices in this show are questionable. Many of the characters sound like they're solidly in their mid 40s. Hi, how are you? Because you know me, I'm a real dream come true. Would you be my date tonight? I'm too old for you. The boy never goes into Lyoko. He sees Aelita as his waifu, and for the first season, the gang's goal is to materialize her. Jeremy stays up night after night working on his special code to get his waifu IRL. Dude never even enters Lyoko, though. Say it with me. You're a pussy. So then we have Aelita, the AI girl inside of the computer. Jeremy sees her as his waifu. I've said that. The first story is all about materializing her. I've said that. But she's got pink hair and so much mystery. She sighs every time she enters the tower. So much pain. And enters the code Lyoko to deactivate its power. I've said that. She has more memories to recover, to uncover the mystery of Lyoko. The goal of materializing her is their biggest challenge in defeating Xana, because once they materialize her, they can shut down the computer. If they do that beforehand, they'll lose both her and Xana. And even though these are our main characters, the school is full of just a few more characters. You have Sissy, the principal's daughter. She plays a Candace-like character, always trying to get to the bottom of everything and get the gang in trouble. She has two dorky minions, of course, who does everything she says, but she secretly wants to be friends with everyone. Jim, the gym teacher, is first a tough obstacle to sneak around, but later he turns into an ally. But Odd blackmails him because Jim has a secret history as a disco movie star but everyone finds out and f loves him. He likes these kooky kids. While most episodes of Code Lyoko are usually episodic, each season typically has an overarching plotline that is set up in the first few episodes and resolved in the final few episodes of each season. The first episode just throws you into the thick of it in kind of a refreshing way. It assumes you can keep up with and figure out the origin of all these characters and story without actually seeing the origin, meaning this show has more faith in its audience of children than most blockbusters have in its audience of adults. You need to explain where the super computer comes from. So Xana slips out into the real world and takes over this high-tech device, just a teddy bear, but it starts attacking the world. So the Lyoko warriors have to go into Lyoko, take down Xana's tower to stop the teddy bear from attacking before they inevitably roll back time to reset all the consequences of Xana's havoc. Such silly stuff. POV, you found out about Lyoko, but we reset time to gaslight you. But in the next episode, Xana takes over a nuclear power plant and is threatening to blow it up. Perfect silly little stories for kids. They have to prevent the nuclear plant from blowing up while they also have to practice for the talent show. They need a driver. But the premise does allow for a lot of fun plot lines. In one episode, Xana traps everybody in a time loop and they have to figure out how to break it. And in another episode, Xana separates Jeremy from the rest of the gang by creating replicants of all of the other members and a virtual world to trap everybody else in. Jeremy actually goes into Lyoko, into this fake 2D world because he's not worthy of a 3D model. Kid never gets a 3D model. The setup of the show allows for all kinds of plot lines and mayhem on the school grounds, Catech Academy. And they really don't try to limit themselves with some logic. But of course, like many shows with a high episode count, things can get tiresome episode to episode. But that's more of a product of the fact that this show has to sell products. And that's a fact. Each Code Lyoko season introduces new vehicles, changed characters, and new locations to create a thread between these episodes. And these threads are the highest stakes in kids' cartoons because 
because Aang hadn't started going after the Fire Lord yet. Can they bring Aelita into the real world? Yeah. Jeremy is able to develop the code and Aelita is free to roam the real world. I'm wondering if Jeremy's seen Ex Machina at this point. As Aelita starts recovering more of her memory, she eventually remembers that she was a real girl, which then leads them to the discovery of the mysterious creator of Lyoko, Franz Hopper, who turns out to be Aelita's real dad, who also created Xana. Why? So many mysteries to unfold. Franz Hopper, like Sonic's mom in Sonic Underground, leaves clues behind to be discovered as they continue to find ways to shut down Xana. And guess what? They find out that Franz Hopper's the one who stuck Aelita in the computer. What a schmuck. A mysterious schmuck. But no teenage story is complete without interpersonal character drama. So Yumi and Ulrich, they're always wrestling with each other, but now Yumi's looking at William. Does she want to wrestle with him, Ulrich thinks? But how can Yumi and Ulrich ever talk about their feelings? It's always high stakes. It's exhausting. And I'm just watching it. Imagine being them. The amount of calories those brains must burn. They're so large. So William finds out about Lyoko and one thing leads to another and he joins the team, but he's cocky and his carelessness puts him in the control of Santa. William, you should have listened. Your boastfulness was your downfall. It's like a green ranger situation for like two seasons. Is he going to be good? Is he on the team? I don't know. People did not like season four, the evil William saga. Sure, he makes a cool avatar for Xana, but I like him more as like the antagonistic anti-hero on the team itself. I don't vibe with the whole villain mind controls a character storyline usually. With so much mystery and story to be uncovered with Aelita's memories and her past, I find it very funny that the origin story, the story of the kids actually meeting Aelita and finding the supercomputer for the first time isn't told right away. It's not needed. But in a way, it's really ingenious to do an origin story between the second and third season. It's just an interesting way to get new people into the show. The prequel movie Xana Awakens, which Jordan goes into a whole lot more in his video. Uh, isn't that right, Jordan? Yeah, William, uh, I'm still here. The best thing about this was to get new viewers into the show. They reassessed Jeremy's voice. Get ready, girls. I'm starting up the devirtualization process. It's the same actor, but much better decisions were made. Aelita, what are you gonna do? Well, Code Lyoko aired on France 3, and get this, France. Été sur France 3. In the United States, it aired on Cartoon Network's mid-2000s action block, Magoozy. Magoozy's coming right back. It sounds like something Jack Black would say, Magoozy. Being a Cartoon Network stan kid, I watched Code Lyoko on the Magoozy block, but I wished it was Toonami. Like, from my perspective, this was the more kiddie version of Toonami. But looking back on it, it's more of a compliment to Toonami because they were both airing the same shows at certain points. It still has a science fiction feeling, but instead of taking place in space, it's underwater and there's all of these alien characters. The whole world in concept was developed by a Adult Swim frequent collaborator, William Street Entertainment. And I do like the underwater characters, but this guy, this guy gives me weird vibes. He gave me weird vibes as a kid. He gives me weird vibes now. A lot of shows aired during this block. Ben 10, Totally Spies, Static Shock, Yu-Gi-Oh, GX, The Winx Club, Kids Next Door, Teen Titans, and even Zatch Bell. Of course, there's a lot of shows from Cartoon Network and Warner Brothers as expected, but there was also a lot of kids anime and a lot of anime inspired shows imported from Europe like The Winx Club, Totally Spies, and this absolutely includes Code Lyoko. The first major project by French production company, Moon Scoop Group. What a fucking great name. Like, I, this is the first time I've said it out loud, Moon Scoop Group. <laughs> That's like the best company name ever. Don't you mess this up, Moon Scoop Group. The Code Lyoko fan base is amazing. Shout out to CodeLyoko.fr for their extremely thorough archival and interview collection. It's been a major help in creating this video. The company was founded when Ant Films purchased France Animation from France Telecom. 
The big financial bet to come from this merger was Code Lyoko. Code Lyoko has its origins in a few earlier projects by Ant Film student interns Tanya Palumbo and Thomas Romain, Leon Font Font Lore Cinema, which screened at the 2000 ANSI International Animated Film Festival. I don't want to pronounce French words or cities. Beautiful place, beautiful people. Ant Films liked the project so much, which gave the two free reign to develop a 26 episode series pitch, which evolved into Garage Kids. By the time the merger happened, although the premise for Garage Kids fit well for a kids action show being about super powered children, France 3 investors viewed its themes as too dark and the title Garage Kids to be too vague. Sophie Desquassettes was brought onto the team as a writer and shaped the concepts into Code Lyoko, and then served as the head writer for the first three seasons. Palumbo and Romain would leave after the change in direction, with Romain specifically not wanting to be a part of a series that doesn't allow its plot to progress for extended periods of time. This dude had a time machine and saw my Lost video. You should too. Unsurprisingly, the virtual world concept itself is heavily inspired by The Matrix. However, just like Digimon Tamers, Code Lyoko also found inspiration from anime. Serial Experiments Lane for its worrying digital dimension in Neon Genesis Evangelion. But the vision of the world was inspired by the popularity of children's video games. This is giving me real tack in the power of Juju vibes. A perfect representation to this was the format itself, boldly choosing to use 3D animation for the action-packed scenes at a time when 3D animation on TV was largely used for comedy. <sighs> Statement. This is an analysis of the wonkiness of 3D television animation. Code Lyoko is wonky, much like 3D animation for the time. However, a comedy like Jimmy Neutron benefits from the wonky character animation. It's hilariously fitting for the characters and the humor. But Code Lyoko's wonkiness doesn't really take away from it. It just feels like a real video game cutscene. What's going on? Ah, friends? <laughs> Giving me real Pac-Man World 2 vibes. The repetitive music choices also feel like a video game. There's like the battling the evil minions song, then like the character drama song, and of course the strings from the theme song. But that's okay when they reuse that one over and over again because this theme song goes unreasonably hard. It doesn't need to at all. This is Code Lyoko, but it's the highlight of every single episode. Just slaps. Of course, as an action cartoon, Code Lyoka has tons of toys and play sets, many of which were regionally exclusive. I would have caused so much havoc as a kid if I had the RC Odd and Ulrich toys. But with its unique aesthetic, I was really excited to try out a Code Lyoko game. Not the one for the Nintendo DS, but the one for the Nintendo Wii. I want to feel like I'm in Lyoko. I'm even going to use my Wii Motion Plus. I wish I could use my balance board. I want to feel like I'm in Lyoko. As far as licensed games go, this is pretty okay. And honestly, there's not much I can say about it besides showing it off. The 2D overworld is very charming and has a polished visual novel style, complete with voice acting and even simple character animations to really bring the 2D world to life. In the action stages, the Wii of course could not get those smooth edges from the show perfectly, but it's pretty wild how much of a one-to-one -one experience this game feels like. I mean, the Lyoko scenes in the show always felt like a video game level, so now they've translated it and it just works. The platforming is not tight by any means. There's just not a lot of follow through with the movement animation, I suppose. So it's just clunky donkey when you're moving around. It's a multi-character action platformer that has you swapping between the four Lyoko warriors to beat certain enemies and traverse certain terrain. Ulrich is a close range sword slasher. Yumi is acrobatic and can lock onto multiple targets with her fans. It's lightly satisfying to bust up a chain of enemies. Odd is a little cat boy and can climb walls. He also has a pretty spammy projectile. Aelita sucks ass. Get good, Aelita. They even have all of the dopey little enemies from the show. The crab cube, the regular crab, the large crab, the slimy one, and the sexy one. This guy, he has legs. These are long legs, but the legs are also his guns. So before he shoots you, He's got a pose. There are levels modeled after the sectors of Lyoko, the desert, mountains, forest, and ice world, as well as sector five, the all blue video game type world that had a non-existent contrast on my CRT TV. It was just blue. 
taking place between seasons three and four, Xana William is the main antagonist and he's such a little loser. Being the mid-stage boss all the time and grunting and shit. Yeah. 2D Jeremy's always interrupting and telling us what to do. Shush, you stupid idiot. You come here if you want to tell us what to do. Also, if you go into this one room in the game, you can see all of these fan submitted OC monsters. Did you draw Code Lyoko monsters as a kid? Did you draw as a kid? What did you draw? Did you draw how to draw manga? Comment down below, like this video, subscribe, follow me on social media, all of that. Overall, if I were a kid who liked Code Lyoko, this game would be pretty fucking awesome, but I'm a grown adult. And I played more of it than I had to. But just a warning, if you don't like Code Lyoko, do not play this game. With the Wii Remote, it's incredibly immersive, and I wouldn't want you to get trapped up in it. Lyoko, that is. Don't want to pull a Franz Hopper now, do we? He got trapped in the Digital Sea, the place in Lyoko where you f***ing die in real life. Following Code Lyoko, Moonscoop Group got a little too excited about its financial success and decided it was time to take over the world with their Code Lyoko money. They started making all sorts of small acquisitions and founding small companies to expand their brand. Code Lyoko. But they did try to make another show, Hero 108, about this bricked up looking guy who's a superhero. It's the only other show listed on their Wikipedia, so I can't wait to tell you how all of this business acquisition went. Moonscoop Group acquired other animation companies like Lux Animation and, and Mike Young Entertainment. They acquired a human being. They also founded Xana Post Productions, which handled a lot of the post-production aspects of the show. I'm editing this and realized no person would call a company Xana Post Productions. They were expecting Code Lyoko money to take them to the moon, so they had to figure out what was next for Code Lyoko. And it turns out the process of figuring it out was very expensive. There was a lot of plans for what could be next for Code Lyoko. Code Lyoko Reloaded was a sky open, endless possibilities look into the future of Code Lyoko. They were gonna do a season five, a theme park expansion, an MMO, a Code Lyoko MMO. That would be better than the Wii game. Could you imagine the, the forehead slider for the character customization? If you hate the live action sequel that ended up happening to Code Lyoko, you'll hate it even more when you hear what their plans for season five was which Jordan goes over in his video. Yes, that's right. The continuation of Code Lyoko eventually became Code Lyoko Evolutions, a hybrid live action 3D animated show, which replaces the 2D scenes with the live action material. I'm sure it was kind of envisioned that new audiences could jump in, but this is a continuation of the show and it didn't air on France 3, it aired on France 4. Now that's an evolution if I've ever seen one, but it aired on Netflix internationally. So Xana has escaped the supercomputer and entered another supercomputer, meaning they have to turn the original supercomputer back on after the end of the series and take on Santa to find out where it's hosting itself. In the live action world, the casting is pretty all right, actually odd is awesome. He's literally a shithead kid, but they don't do the hair dye very well. Like sometimes you can barely tell it's on. He's so much more charming when he's portrayed by an actual child. He comes off so creepy when he's voiced by a full grown man. Um, me, Mrs. Hertz. And it's amazing that they got Anne Hathaway and Hugh Grant's long lost son to play Ulrich. Hopefully Xana doesn't get him. It's strange because besides maybe the Ben 10 movies, I can't think of another animated property to be started as an animated show and then continued in a live action format? In a way, on paper, it works. I mean, the original show was a hybrid format, but it's here when you realize that the 2D world of Code Lyoko actually brought a lot. <laughs> The energy is just dropped, translating it from one medium to another. But it does have that lame Disney Channel live action cartoon energy, if you know what I'm saying. The usage of After Effects in this series goes fucking hard. Look at that distortion, those particle effects. That's fucking awesome. I could do that. 
I, I did that as a child, playing in After Effects. Aelita's wig looks like she has a real passion for cosplaying at school, but apparently she has competition as other students wear Amazon.com wigs. I think the 2D scenes in the OD show are a lot more engaging because large set pieces are obviously a lot easier to create for animation than for live action. Odd nearly drowning to death in the original show is the kind of stakes you won't get here. The evil clones and specters are Xana's biggest weapons, IRL. It's just sort of real people made into the show's monsters. Though the evil child who chases everyone for one episode is just hilarious. The specters touch people to drain their powers in Lyoko, so the specters are always hugging people and shit. Like he's 70 pounds, kick him. Back in the original show, Yumi and Auric die. Like for real, they go inside of like an oven or a microwave and then they're like cooked to death. Their bodies slump over and they die. But then they reset time and they're brought back to life. But they remember that shit. This child, this child does not embody those stakes, though he is fast as fuck. On the flip side though, the 3D animated world in Evolutions is awesome. The animation looks better and the characters are very charming. Jerome Muscadet, who would serve as the director of Code Lyoko, and Sophie de Quasse would originally come on to the Evolutions project to be the head writers, but after some unspecified creative differences, they would leave the project. So they find out that Alita's mom is actually still alive. Franz Hopper's inside of the computer, dead, but her mom's still out there, and she's remarried to her evil stepdad who runs the computer that's hosting Xana, and he likes it. And them finding this out is where it ends. It ends on a cliffhanger. There's no conclusion besides the Italian exclusive novels. And there are translations of these novels, but I don't feel like diving into them. So this is where Code Lyoko ends to me, with Aelita discovering her evil stepdad. So why is there not any more Code Lyoko? Well, in 2013, during the production of Code Lyoko Evolution, Moon Scoop Group started having some big financial troubles. Apparently, some internalized disputes caused a shareholder pullout, and Moon Scoop Group soon fell into bankruptcy. And the lawsuits from their prior acquisitions didn't help either. They couldn't keep funding Code Lyoko Evolutions, which was in post-production at this time. They even failed to pay some of their actors money that was owed to them. Live action Ulrich, presumably the child of Hugh Grant and Anne Hathaway, opened up on Twitter about not getting compensated for his performance. And now he's selling NFTs, meaning Xana got him. So Moon Scoop Group's assets were scooped up by a media franchising company, Darguard, a Skyrim ass name. They transferred Moon Scoop's assets and remaining employees to their subsidiary, MediaToon Distribution, who started posting Code Lyoko on YouTube for free. The lesson here, is that if you make like a cult classic, don't get greedy. So that's all I can fit in my forehead. But if you wanna see the other side of the forehead, be sure to check out Jordan's video. It's been really fun to have somebody to work on this with. Uh, isn't that right, Jordan? Yeah, this was an absolutely great time. Haha. <laughs>